Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, MAP047A ANSI A118.15 Improved Modified Dry Set Mortar, LHT, and ANSI Mortar Designations. We have some brief housekeeping before we start. Your phones are on mute. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box in the corner of your screen, and we'll answer them at the end of today's session time permitting, or via email after. And you can always send questions to mapaydigital at mapay.com. This is also an AIA accredited webinar, so credits are available. Please send your AIA number if you're interested. Now, without further delays, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Jim Whitfield. Jim is MAPE's Technical Services Director and has been active on many industry committees over the years. Currently serving as the president of the Materials and Methods Standards Association, he also belongs to the National Tile Contractors Association's Technical Committee and the Tile Council of North America's Handbook Committee. In addition, Jim is a voting member of the ANSI ASC A108 Committee. In 2001, he was elected to the Elite Fellowship of the Construction Specifications Institute thanks to his contributions to education in the construction industry. Jim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jen. Welcome. I appreciate you taking your afternoon and spending some time with us. Some of you in the morning, I guess, if you're out there on the West Coast, but taking some time with us. I know this has been a busy week. If you're real involved in industry, um, I say that we've got the TCNA uh, board meeting happening this week, or it's, it's just finished yesterday, but that was uh, a good 12, 15 hours this week. Uh, and we've got TSP virtual, the, the TSP show, Total Solutions Plus, since we're not out there in Palm Springs this week uh, due to COVID. So uh, a lot of us have been spending a lot of time on the computers between webinars and, and conferences and meeting with customers in our in our virtual booths as well as the TCNA board meeting. So there's a lot of positive changes going on in the industry. Um, one I won't address today, but I'll certainly mention uh, while we're before we get started, and that's that we recently passed the uh, ANSI A108.21, 10820 uh, standard for the installation of gauge porcelain tile exterior. So that will be in publication before the end of the year. I think that's a pretty exciting thing. We've been waiting for that, working hard on it, and uh, we've got that through committee and, and, and done. So anyway, let me go back a little bit and talk about some of the other major changes we've made in recent years. And I say these because these are ones that, that really I get a lot of questions about. I, I mean, daily, I get questions about all three of these three things. And I think they're not very well understood. So hopefully I'll add some clarification and explain it in a way that you fully understand it. So let me get started. Um, this is an AIA program. As Jen mentioned, uh, if you would like credit, please send your AIA number and name, etc. cetera, to, uh, you can put it on the chat screen or send it to MaPay Digital at mapay.com, as well as uh, designer uh, credits as well for the International Design Continuing Education Council. So let's talk about some of the objectives in this program. We're going to talk about my perspective or manufacturer's perspective on industry industry standards and new mortar classifications. I think they're important, and of course that's why I bring this subject up again. What's the hype behind 11815 mortars? If you haven't heard it, you certainly will. Um, 11815 mortars are the newest mortar, and um, I'll explain to you where they came from and why you might consider them for your project. What's the big deal about ISO designations and, and as well as mortar designations for ANSI? We now have designations in ANSI that not just 118.4, but it could say 118.4H. Would you really know what that means? You should. Uh, for non-SAG, T is the nomenclature or the designation for fast set, F. For extended open time, E. And large and heavy tile mortar or what used to be medium bed mortars, H. Uh, I'll explain in a lot more detail what these mean and how they might actually look on your data sheet or on your uh, actual packaging. 
And really, how can these designations help you? It's important to understand how they benefit you in a project. So I'll get into a lot more detail on that. Let me start with ISO, because I think this is really where a lot of this started. ISO is an independent, non-government, international organization uh, with a lot of membership of, of 264 different national standards bodies, much like ANSI. Through designate, design, delegates to 50 different countries, it brings together the industry to share knowledge, uh, develop voluntary consensus-based market-relevant international standards. Why does it matter? Because ISO, really in this case, in this presentation, initially created the, the, the designations that we're going to talk about for mortars. Um, and they still have some that we have not been able to incorporate Nancy today. So I'll talk to you about some of those. With that, I'm going to share a little bit more on ISO. <clears throat> ISO has basically two big classifications in ISO 1307. 1307 is for ceramic tile uh, mortars and, and, and so on. Um, but in adhesives, you've got a C classification. Then there's number one or for normal. C1 would be just a basic thin set. C2 would be an improved thin set. You've got, again, characteristics like fast setting. For, and again, let's see, uh, C2F or C2T, you may have a combination of both of these. Having a fast setting mortar that's non-slip would be a good example. So, um, you combine these in, in the definition of the product. So C2, FT, uh, and there's some designations that we currently don't have in ANSI. And so I really want to point them out here. There's an S1 for deformable or flexible, if you might, and S2 for highly deformable or highly flexible. I use flexible as a term because it's a lot easier to understand. But basically, I'll show you how what that looks like and, and how they, they determine that in testing. There's a P1 and P2. So much like we have a, a ANSI uh, 118.11 for exterior grade plywood mortar, uh, they have a C1, C2, P1, P2. So it could be a C1, FT, P1. So it's fast setting, non-slip, and works well over plywood. Then the major type of adhesive would be dispersion. Um, you might think of dispersion as mastics. There's a D1 and a D2 for improved. And then accelerated drying, A. Slip resistant, T. Extended open time, E. We also have an R for reaction resin. Epoxies and urethanes are most common in reaction resin type ones. There is a R1 and an R2. Again, R2 being improved. The only real characteristic there or uh, designation is T for non-slip. So uh, resin, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, R2, T would be a urethane that you might use on a vertical surface and has good slip resistance. Um, our Planet Creek W is a good example of something like that. They also have designations for grouts. There's a CG for cementitious grouts and an RG for re reaction resin grouts, being epoxy as an example. So for CG, you would have a number one and a number two improved. So you got a CG2 would be uh, like our 118.7 uh, improved latex modified grout. And they have special characteristics or designations like F for fast setting, A for high abrasion resistance, or W for reduced water absorption. Of course, water absorption typically relates more to staining and so on. And then there's reaction resin or epoxy type grouts. And uh, the only real characteristic there is high performance characteristics compared to cementitious grouts. So where would you really use these? As a towel contractor, one place where you might use, use designations is to really understand the product that you're selecting for a project. Let's say, for instance, you've got a gauge porcelain tile going on an exterior of a building um, and on the walls. So you want to have non-sag characteristics for the walls, obviously. You want to make sure that you've got extended open time, right? We're putting mortar on top of the tile, on the back of the tile. We're also putting mortar on the substrate. So that takes a lot of open time. So 
uh, in that case, you might be looking for a um, C2 TE, like you see here in the in the here as a designation. Um, that gives you cementitious mortar improved with non-slip characteristics and extended open time. I hope that makes it a little bit clearer for you. Uh, it really helps for comparing products comparatively. Uh, if you're looking at one product that both say that they're 118.4, that can get a little bit confusing because 118.4 can have products from the lowest spectrum to the very highest performing on the spectrum. So this helps dial it into the characteristics you're looking for specifically for the type of job that you're trying to accomplish. So you can easily clarify exactly what it is, the product that you're picking up and how it might be best for the project you're working on. You'd be confident that these materials are actually gonna perform specific for the way that you selected them and may feel a lot more comfortable in providing a warranty on that project because of that. Architect, you know, I think they probably more importantly are really looking for generic terms instead of having to call out a specific product. Uh, and uh, instead of calling out our, uh, our CareFlex Super, um, they want to be able to call out a C2 TE and, and make sure that there are other people that can bid that so that they get a good comparative competitive bid. Um, they're able to, again, pick products that are specific for the characteristics they need on their project. Maybe they're on fast track construction, so they want to use fast heavy mortars. Um, or for that matter, uh, the area of the tiles going in is, is exposed to heavy traffic. Uh, they want to use a fast heavy mortar so people can get on it quicker. Maybe they're looking for better flexibility in controlling the cost on their project. So they're really trying to narrow down the product and get bids as competitive as they can. From an owner standpoint, they know they're getting exactly what they're looking for in a mortar or an adhesive uh, compared to what they want for the life cycle of their building. They're trying to get an installation that will perform well and that hopefully will secure them a better warranty. And I think a lot of these characteristics that we're talking about in mortar designations and so on are also just in general to ANSI. You know, why might a tile setter really pay attention to this? Why should an architect or an owner pay attention to it? Very, very important. So again, how to choose the proper adhesive. I'm not gonna go through this whole page. It's just kind of a, a wrap up, if you might, of the adhesive. Uh, you see the cementitious, um, but one thing that is unique to ANSI, as I said, I'm sorry, that is unique to ISO, is they have deformable and deformable improved. Pay attention to that. Uh, the manufacturers that list ISO as well as ANSI, my, my pay being a good example, um, I know of at least one other competitor that puts it on a lot of their packaging, the ISO. Uh, pay attention to that. I think you'll appreciate finding the ones that have some good flexibility when you really need that. All right, how does that fit into ANSI? So when it comes to ANSI, we've got really four different mortars today. We've got a 118.1, a dry set cementitious mortar. I should say four different cement-based mortars today. 118.4, a modified cement-based mortar. So typically it's modified with polymer, right? So we get a little adhesive value out of it, get some little bit more flexibility. 11811 is generally a little bit better than 118.4 in that it'll also bond to plywood, much like the P1 or P2 in ISO. The new one came out in the early, I wanna say it was 2012. 2013 is 118.15, improved modified dry set mortar. So I'll spend a little bit more time on this one because it's new. I think it's important that you understand it and you may find situations where you really want to make sure that you use a 118.15 mortar. So at the same time we added, came out with the 118.15 mortar back in 2012, uh, we also added mortar designations. And most people have not really paid much attention to this in ANC but you'll find it on all of our packaging, on all of our data sheets, and I know other manufacturers are incorporating it every day. So they're starting to get used out there. So uh, I, it's easy to say you've got a extended open time E or fast setting or non-SAG. What does that really look like? Uh, it could be a 118.1 E, so it's got extended open time and a dry set mortar, right? 118.4 uh, modified with fast setting. So your rapid setting mortars, that's what you should be finding on the package or data sheet. 
If you're looking for something you can use on a wall with real non-sag characteristics with thixotropic type pro uh, properties, you're looking up for a 118. And again, it could be 118.1, could be 118.4, could be 118.15, uh, but with the T characteristic or designation after it. So you can combine these. I may want one that has extended open time with non-sag characteristics. It's really a good example of combining them. That would look like a 118.4 TE. Again, this could be a 118.1 TE, could be a 118.15 TE. The designations could be used in any three of these categories, 118.1, 118.4, or 118.15, and combinations of the same. Just last year, we finally got voted a medium bed mortar standard. That mortar can be used in, again, 118.1, 118.4, or 118.15, and receives an H designation, large and heavy tile mortar. I will get into this in a lot more detail um, as far as why large and heavy tile mortar today instead of what we used to call medium bed. So when we came out with the 118.15, the idea being that at the time, 118.4 was all we had if there was polymers or modifications to the mortar. And we really felt like that wasn't enough. We had products that were very, very good called a 118.4, and we also had some that were just barely passing called a 118.4. Really large differences in the spectrum. Um, so what ended up happening is we created a new standard, 118.15, for improved, modified dry set mortars. This new standard uh, establishes high performance mortars with higher strengths, higher shear strengths, higher compressive strengths. I'll show you that in a chart, as well as a new heat aging test. I think you're going to find this very, very interesting. So 118.4, if you might, has kind of became the standard for a basic or standard modified mortar. 118.15 is your high-end or high-performance type mortar, again, modified. Heat aging, let me explain that to you. Take two by two porcelain tiles, you bond them together face to face, offset it an eighth of an inch at, at the time you're setting it. That specimen cures for 14 days, basically at room temperature, 70 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit. That is followed by 14 days at 158 degrees in the oven. 158 degrees. So we're sitting there for 14 days at room temperature and then 14 days at 158 degrees. At that time, after 28 days of cure, room temperature as well as heat aging, it still has to have a shear bond strength of greater than 400 PSI. That's very, very high. So you can imagine with something like this, you can't do it by just increasing your cement. It's not all about strength. Um, that'll help you through the fire, but that won't help you when it comes to trying to get high shear strengths. So it requires a good polymer, a solid polymer, um, one that has good flexibility to it uh, or deformability, if you might, uh, in order for it to pass this test. Where might you use a 118.15 mortar? Heck, you might use it like on this porch. Uh, I moved to Florida from Colorado. Um, I spent many, many years of my life in, 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 in winter climates, uh, Colorado as well as the Chicago area, where you got freeze thaw. Now, let me talk about Colorado because I think it's a great example. This week they got snow. I think they got up to about a foot of snow. I, I believe it was Monday so or Sunday. Um, but regardless, uh, the day before, it was 78 degrees. And today, I don't know what it is, but it could be in the high 50s. So let's say you got a foot of snow, and that night, you know, it drops down and, and, and gets cold and freezes. The next day, uh, temperatures get warm up, and, and again, this is not uncommon in a lot of climates, uh, and you're up in the 60, 70 degree range. So all that snow that's sitting there starting to melt and basically soak into your deck, your tile installation. It's in the grout, it's past the grout, it's in the mortar bed. And, and, and melting and, and, and you know, starting to, to, to wet out that, that installation. That next night, it drops down again. It gets into the 40s, maybe even down to freezing. So the water that's in that installation 
you know, really has to perform. Uh, the, the, the mortars in, in have to really perform in order for it to accommodate the water that's in there. So ideally with a high performance mortar like 118.15 mortar, uh, in addition to it having higher strengths, it's, it is allowed to or manufactured to uh, allow for def deformation um, so it can handle expansion, contraction, and so on, and still hold itself together. Maybe an area where you anticipate having deflection a lot of movement. An area where bond strength is critically important or where having a high shear strength is important. In other words, you've got stress that's being applied to the tile that may not be equal to what's being applied to the, to the slab or for that matter, a frame construction. Probably what's most common is where you really need thermal resistance, where you can handle expansion, contraction, temperature changes, uh, and so on. <clears throat> or where heat resistance is important. All those would be suitable areas for 118.15 mortar. You might, just thinking about this, uh, really put that in your mind and, and, and come up with different projects that you'd use it on. This is some of the testing. The testing that you see in yellow, the top is just uh, uh, telling you what the test is. Um, open time, it's 20 minutes to 28 days, then it's tinsel bond, uh, and so on and so on. And then the fourth row, fourth column, if you might, is 118.1, a basic dry set mortar. 118.4 is in the fifth column. And the sixth column is 118.15. So let's do a comparative. Let's just say we're looking at uh, seven days cure on a glazed wall tile, tiles bonded tile. With 118.1, we're anticipating in seven days it should have a 200 PSI at a minimum. With 118.4, we're anticipating 50% increase or 300 PSI. 118.15, again, a 50% increase, 450 PSI. With that 28 day heat aging on that same installation, tile to tile, wall tile in this case, um, after 28 day heat, heat aging, that shear bond test should be at least 450 PSI. When you look at the porcelain mosaic, as you see down here in the next boxes, uh, this lower row, you can really see, I'm gonna grab one of these things so I can kind of point some things out if you don't mind. Um, so you see down here, heat aging, 28 days, but porcelain tile, again, tile to tile, um, and then a shear bond test. It's not even done when it comes to 118.1. That test is not done when we do 118.4, but we're anticipating 400 PSI when it's done with the 118.15 mortar. That's high. Again, that's higher than the basic uh, mortars are, are expected to perform. There's not a 400 PSI in any of the porcelain tile bonds, 118.4 or 118.1. That's very, very high. So again, you can kind of get a bit of an idea how much it increases the strengths just by looking at this chart. And I know this chart isn't the clearest, I apologize. Um, it seems a little fuzzy and I'm not really quite sure why, but uh, really honestly getting much higher strengths when it comes to the 118.15 mortar. Come on. There we go. All right, let's talk about LHT. Hopefully you've got a clear understanding of 118.15 where you might use that on your next project, um, why this thing came about and the importance of having a 118.15 mortar because I think it's important to have in your tool belt. All right, let's talk about LHT mortar because this has been something that's been being worked on for many, many years. Uh, about seven, eight years ago um, in ANSI, we really started debating whether medium bed should even be a term. And we'll get into a little bit more definition on this and why that's the case. But uh, the fact that medium bed really didn't have an industry definition is probably one of the most important things. And yet things are being called medium bed, medium bed mortars, install it per medium bed method, and so on. Um, 
contractors were starting to see installations from architects uh, uh, specifications that called for install the tile using a medium bed method or a medium bed mortar. So they didn't have a traditional inch and a quarter, inch and a half mortar bed recessed slab. They might have had a slab that was only recessed a half inch or five eighths, and they're told to set it with a medium bed mortar. That really wasn't the intention of the product. Medium bed mortars being asked to correct installation irregularities on a project. Let's say you've got a concrete slab that's really not an industry tolerance. Medium bed mortars are being used to fill in the difference. Industry recognized this is not correct and this is not the right way to do it. We really need to have those substrates prepped properly, period. And then come back with a good consistent mortar. The really the where the medium bed mortar kind of came in is we we're using it from a traditional 330 seconds thin, thinnest depth after it's been beat in to as thick as three quarters of an inch. That's what the intention was, um, but it definitely got sidetracked. So because of the heavy misuse of the term medium bed, that's why it was removed from the tile industry. And large and heavy tile mortar became the new term for those mortars that can be built up thicker. Um, it is defined by performance characteristics, large and heavy tile. It is to support large, heavy tile. The actual test in ANSI requires a minimum of five pounds per square foot tile to be set into the mortar and it not sag. So we're looking for non-sag characteristics in the case of a floor or wall. We're looking for less shrinkage at thicker depths. It's intended to go from 330 seconds to a half inch in continuous thickness after beat in. Really better for bedding these large format tiles. When you think about plank tiles or today's 18 by 36 inch tiles, let's face it, they're not flat, right? Part of it's just kind of the manufacturing process. You get a little bit of warpage. In the case of calibrated versus uh, rectified type porcelains, you can get quite a bit of warpage, but that is all within tolerance. So if you have warpage in the center of the tile, you got a substrate that maybe is not flat, you can imagine you can build up a phenomenal amount of mortar in the center of that in order to get good bedding. So really to bed thicker more, thicker tiles with uh, larger tiles with some warpage. And minor characteristics or, or clear corrections in uh, flatter floors trying to minimize the amount of lippage. So non-sag. Typical in a LHT motor. Um, one thing you find is that they typically have a thixotropic characteristic. Thixotropic would be uh, a good example is ketchup, as you see in the bottom there. You can tip a ketchup bottle over all day long. It's not going to drop drip out. But if you hit the bottom of it or create shear, it'll start to flow. So we install with the notches of the trowel. We set the tile into it. We move the tile back and forth creating shear, we increase coverage that way. That's part of a thixotropic setting material and the non-sag characteristics you see in LHT. So what's the handbook say about LHT? Um, we actually have a handbook meeting coming up next month and I know that all this is being rewritten. So we're, we're, we're making finally making some big changes because the 2020 said is a thin set for bonding ceramic tile and stone formulated by the manufacturer to minimize slump and facilitate a thicker bond coat as compared to bonding mortar that is not labeled as large set, large dry set mortar for large and heavy tile or LHT. It's intended to be used as a bond coat from 330 seconds to a half inch in thickness after the tile has been embedded. LHT is declared by the manufacturer based on its characteristics. There is no ANSI or ISO specifications to for this type of mortar at this time. Um, again, that's not correct anymore. In 2020, we passed the standard, so it is available today. But at the time of printing the handbook, uh, that was still true. We had not created the H designation. So now we have an H designation in ANSI, and that's suitable for 118.1, 118.4, and 118.15 mortars. So you can have a 118.8, 118.15H. So you know that that is a good. Uh, medium bed mortar, or for that matter, large and heavy tile mortar. 
going on a little bit more with what the handbook says about it. It says the characteristics of, it, characteristics of an LHT mortar make it useful for setting heavy tiles, generally tiles that are five pounds per square foot or heavier, and tiles with ungauged thickness. So um, helpful for setting large tiles, ones with one edge greater than 15 inches. And for large tiles where a thicker bond coat is advantageous in order to get mortar coverage when there's warpage in the tile, slight irregularity in the substrate, um, again, typically occurring in the center of the tile. Refer to ANSI A137.1 for allowable warpage in ceramic tile. I'm not going to get into that in this presentation. Again, going on to the handbook. It, there's an important note to specifiers or architects if you might specify in this type of product. LHT is not intended for truing or leveling substrates or the work of others. The substrate variation exceeds when where substrate variation exceeds allowances, LHT cannot be used to remedy such because the application would exceed the limitations in the mortar. LHT is intended to be used to install tile per ANSI A108.5, which is the installation of tile with a dry set or latex modified mortar, and the installation standard for installing tile by a thin bed method. Again, going on to the note to specifier, accordingly, LHT is a product, not an installation method. Project plans and specifications that call for or refer to setting tile by medium bed method or large and heavy method, or that call for the use of the bonding mortar to level, flatten, or fill substrates to create slopes between finished floor heights do not conform to the industry standards. Again, why might you use a, a, a LHT mortar? Well, for years they've been used because of the irregularity in stone, right? We pull out stone, it's not always the same thickness. It's not manufactured by man. It's not really intended to. It's cut. It's split. It's, uh, you know, as I think kept together fairly close in thicknesses, but certainly not consistent in thickness. So it's to support large and heavy units, uh, like the tile you see being beat in in the upper left-hand corner. Um, and ungauged slate, to me, that is one good example of it. You know. Uh, Slate today that we're using and installing is really slate that we used to use for roofing in a lot of cases. You might find in an 18 inch piece, at one edge of the 18 inch piece, it's three quarters of an inch, at the other end, it's three eighths of an inch. So we're having to make up that three eighths of an inch with mortar, as well as get it set well into a good bedding. Um, it works well when it comes to box screening. Now let me explain box screening a little bit. Um, this is a, a very, very well-built box suite that you see here in the bottom on the left. But a common one might be, again, let's say we're taking slate and we've cut, we've we've gone through all of the slate and found that the thickest piece that we've got is five-eighths of an inch thick. The thinnest one is three-eighths of an inch thick, as an example. But they all are very irregular. If I wanted to have an eighth of an inch bedding coat, if you might, or, or, or thin set coat uh, on that mortar, I might take the finish side of this ungauged slate, lay it down on a mortar table or a plywood table for that matter with a hole cut in the middle, and I'm going to cut rails on the outside of this tile. Let's say it's 18 by 18 inch in, in size. At 18 inches, I'm going to cut a two by two rail down to three quarters of an inch thick. That way, when I lay down a five eighths inch uh, uh, tile face first. I can lay a few of them down in a on a mortar table with these screeds on the outside. Fill it up with mortar, screed it off, and every piece I pull out of there should be three quarters of an inch thick. So that means every piece will have a minimum an eighth of an inch bedding uh, underneath it. Notch out the floor with a minimal notch trowel and set them together. Very very common way to set irregular tiles. Used to be used a lot for uh, when we were doing mosaic murals and we had all kinds of different things being used in the mosaic murals from pieces of gold to stone to shells to you name it. That's how they would get a consistent thickness. All right, again, reasons why you might consider a large and heavy tile mortar, large format tile, heavy tiles of all size. 
they've been asked to set pavers like you see here. We certainly have. Um, warp tiles to reduce, reduce potential for lippage to get a good flat substrate. To adjust for the ability to take out imperfections in the tile or stone, meaning warpage. Or in the case of ungauged slate, to get that a good consistent thickness. Or even for that matter, specialty tile like Saltillo tile. That's another great one to fill in the back of, you know, put the face down, fill in the back, back buttered if you might, and then set it to a notch floor. What you don't want to do with regular thin set is one thing you don't want to hear is I can correct any imperfections with my thin set. And I do hear that. You need to stay within the industry tolerances. For tiles with one edge, eighth of an inch or um, 15 inches or longer, your tolerance for substrate should be no more than one eighth of an inch and 10 feet or 16th of an inch and two feet. That means we should be using self-levelers or whatever it takes um, wall prep materials in order to get those substrates flat before we start setting tile to them. Why? Because if we don't, having an irregular substrate and tile that's a little bit out of, not the flattest if you might, um, you're gonna end up with a phenomenal amount of lippage issues. You don't wanna use a basic thin set in depths of half inch and greater because uh, you're going to get shrinkage. They're intended really to go from 330 seconds, the minimum thickness, up to about a quarter of an inch in, after it's been beat in or embedded. The large and heavy tile mortars can go up to a half inch in thickness down to 330 seconds. So they can go twice the thickness without any shrinkage. This picture you see in the lower right hand corner is an interesting picture on the job site that I took personally. I got asked to come out and look at a project that had, um, well, they basically said they installed the floor and then the grout joints started opening up. I got asked to go down and look at this thing. Um, I was in Atlanta. I had to go up to, I don't know, it was a 10th, 14th, 15th story of a, a condo project. I walked in and what you see here in this picture is exactly what I saw. This stone tile was set almost butt jointed. They came back the next day and they saw just what you see in this picture. Joints that were anywhere from an eighth of an inch or greater to some that are still butt tight. And they couldn't understand why this occurred. They had, I asked them to take a few tiles out right in the middle of this area that's a little bit thicker. And they didn't have to go very far before I understood what they'd done. They had set this tile and the bedding underneath it, the amount of mortar they used to get this reasonably flat in the floor was an inch and a half or greater. I kid you not. So they took standard mortar, had it as thick as an inch and a half in some areas, um, some down to probably an inch and a quarter, but regardless, they really built this up uh, in this room and it caused the mortar to shrink. That shrinkage is what opened up the grout joints here. The installer who did this was a very large gentleman. Um, found out he had actually been a linebacker for the Atlanta Falcons. And with the architect, the general contractor, and the homeowners standing around, I suggested that me and him go down to his truck and get another tool. He said he didn't have anything he had to get down to the truck, and then he wanted to talk about everything in front of his customers. And I strongly, strongly suggested we get downstairs and talk about it. And we did. Um, I went down there and I told him basically, look, you know, you've used this mortar way beyond its its, its expectations or beyond, beyond what it, it should be used for. You're gonna have to be responsible for this and take it out and reinstall this floor. We're gonna go back up there. You're gonna tell them that it was your mistake and you know how to correct it. And I'll help you with the materials to get this thing done. We went back up there to a very angry room because we left the room and he stepped right up and, and, and took responsibility for every bit of it and his installers. And uh, that project was redone to everybody's satisfaction. But you really have to be careful when you start building up mortars, 
they really can shrink. I know you may not believe it, but this is honest to God, a great example and a true picture from a job site and how much it changed after they left the job site. Spot bonding has got to be one of my biggest pet peeves today. Because they don't prep walls properly, it's not uncommon for installers to five spot, or in this case, as you see here, uh, they're nine spotting the back of the tile and shove it into maybe notch trowel, I'm sorry, uh, uh, back buttered cement, cement board or, or this uh, substrate. It's a very, very weak bond that is susceptible to impact and will generally fail. The reason why they're doing it is because those blobs, they can move them around and get them level with the one next to it. The only reason they have to do that is because their substrate preparation is poor and their mortar can't be applied at just one thickness. That's not good. Spot bonding is something I see in my office weekly. Why? Because they fail consistently all the time. Um, if you're online and you're looking at on Facebook, maybe some of the tile websites like Tile Geeks or um, Gage Porcelain Tile, the world of Gage Porcelain Tile or some of those, there's people posting these projects all the time showing how spot bonding had caused a, caused a failure. It's unfortunate, but it's very true. Again, you build up mortar too thick, you're gonna have shrinkage issues. If you don't get enough coverage, it will fail. Pay attention to the amount of water or polymer that you're adding, follow the directions. It's gonna be the best, be consistent, so you don't have one mixture slumping right next to a mixture that's very stiff. There's no way you can get those tiles flat, so in turn, you're gonna have lippage. When you've got a really loose mix, it's going to want to sink into it. There's just no other choice. It, it, it's just the nature of the mortar. Um, so make sure you mix your mortars consistently, that you have the right mortar, and they use them properly. Try to achieve coverage. All right. So I hope I gave you a little bit better idea why we've got tile installation standards and, and standards for different mortars. It really helps involve and level the playing field for all those involved. Um, if you're bidding a project and an architect calls out for a 118.15 uh, TE mortar, and by theory, everybody that's bidding that should be using a similar mortar. So that's the idea behind it. LHT is a product, not a method. It's truly a designation within our standards, um, not just a product. It's ideal for when you've got minimal service preparation, you got mortar shrinkage, mortar slump, tile warpage, large and heavy tile. So you're really trying to minimize all those things. These LHT mortars when mixed properly will support a tile or stone and a very heavy one um, and still give you coverage through the fixed tropic characteristics of them. Make sure you select the proper mortar for your project. There's nothing wrong with having your favorite mortar, but then if that same mortar cannot be used for every single tile, every single stone, every single substrate, no matter where you go, whether it's interior or exterior, it's just not, we don't make anything like that. Or if we did, it'd be very expensive mortar. Use an LHT mortar when you've got tiles that are one edge 15 inches or greater. Keep in mind your substrate tolerances with those large format tiles, it should be an eighth of an inch and 10 or no more than a 16th of an inch and two feet. That's important when it comes to lippage and getting the tiles nice and flat. No matter what you do, always use movement joints in your design. It's critical. Follow the TCNA handbook method EJ171, um, the current method, which would be EJ17120. All right, I moved through that pretty quick. Um, Jen, you want to see if we've got any questions? We do have some questions, actually, Jim. Uh, the first one When would you use a crack isolation membrane or cleavage membrane, and where does it go? Wow, those two totally different things. Um, so a cleavage membrane generally is to isolate 
uh, an installation from below. Let's let's use an example. If um, I've got a again, let's go back to the condo project. I've got an elevator. In front of that elevator, I want to put in a uh, very nice tile, <clears throat> and it's recessed. So I'm going to put a mortar bed in there. I want that mortar bed to be isolated from the concrete substrate. And the reason for that is because maybe the substrate deflects a lot. So in that case, I would put down, let's say, 10 mil visqueen or plastic, um, or I could use sand for that matter. There's a variety of ways to cleave it, create a cleavage membrane. Could be done with building paper. Um, and then I'm gonna wire reinforce my mortar bed, uh, inch and a quarter thick, inch and a half in the case of wire, in order for that mortar bed, if you might, to be independent of the substrate. So if there's a bit of deflection, my overall tile installation has got its own strength or integrity. I hope that explains cleavage membranes. They're actually not bonded, they're just there to isolate. A crack isolation membrane is different. It is bonded to the substrate, whether it be a sheet, been set it down or adhesively placed down or a peel and stick or whether it is a liquid applied membrane. And it's generally used uh, where you anticipate cracking occurring in the concrete. Now, anybody who knows concrete pretty much assume that you're gonna anticipate cracking period because uh, it eventually does crack. But it's really to isolate, uh, I'm sorry, to, uh, to, to provide a, a slip sheet if you might, um, so that the cracking in the substrate does not transfer directly through to your tile installation. I hope that helps. Well, and there's a follow-up. What about an upper level and you want a waterproof membrane? So I don't see an issue with that. Now let's talk about a couple upper levels. Um, we'll go back to the condo project. Maybe you've got a laundry room and you want to make sure that if the washer floods, that it stays within that room. Um, the fallacy there is that, of course, we got a door. So it's not like creating a shower pan where we can raise the membrane on all three sides. Keep in mind, a shower pan, uh, the membrane should be a minimum of three inches above the curb or the, the highest point in the shower pan. So that if there's flooding, for that matter, it, it kind of holds the water there. In the case of a laundry room, that's not necessarily the case. Um, we're just trying to make sure it doesn't go underneath the walls and into other people's units and, and so on. And, or for that matter, uh, soak down through to a unit below it. So yeah, doing a laundry room floor, uh, wrapping it, you know, a flat membrane is not effective. I'll say that for waterproofing. It has to have some cove um, or it has to come up. So in that case, in a case of a laundry room, you'd wrap it up the walls all the way around. And the only place that you potentially could allow water out would be really be the door. Um, not uncommon to use waterproofing above grade. We see them in bathroom floors too, for probably the same reason. Condos, they don't want to you know, worry about maybe a, a, a flood or somebody letting their tub run over. And they want to hold the water within that bathroom area. Again, uh, when it fills up enough, it's probably going to go out the door. But that's uh, a, a different issue. So um, I hope that addresses that. Well. Uh... Okay, this is the last question so far. Can we get a copy of the presentation? Yes, this will be posted online uh, and uh, www.mapay.us and uh, we will have this up uh, probably in a week or so. And uh, if there are any other questions, um, Now's the time me, to ask let, them. Let me say something about the the copy. Um, if you'd like a, a copy of this, I'll create a PDF and, and just send me your email address uh, through the chat line and say, you know, please email me the, the presentation and I'll be glad to do that. Yeah, that works too. Excellent. Um, okay, well, there aren't any other questions coming in. So I guess this concludes today's webinar. And thank you, everybody, for your time. We know that you have very busy days. We appreciate you taking time out to spend with us. And thank you, Jim. That was a very great presentation. Um, I, it was enjoyable. We learned a lot. Uh, and I guess we'll see you all next time. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Jen. Thank you, Jim. Bye. Bye.